from Community Public Radio, this is the CPR News. From New York, I'm Don DeBar. Today we go to Moscow in the Russian Federation and speak with analyst Mark Sloboda. Uh, Mark, how you doing? Hey, Don. I'm alive. Thanks for having me. It's always an honor and a pleasure to be with you on CPR. Our honor and a pleasure also. So uh, let's see. Um, I guess we will uh, talk about um, the meeting that we didn't get a chance to talk about yet between uh, President Putin of Russia and President Erdogan of Turkey. Okay, so uh, this meeting uh, happened right at the uh, end of September, uh, last Wednesday. Uh, it was a meeting in Sochi, Russia, um, and uh, it comes on a, a tale of uh, almost regular meetings uh, between Putin and Erdogan uh, two or three times a year, uh, for, you know, bilaterally uh, for the last few years. Uh, they've been having regular contacts. Um, let, let me provide a little backdrop to, to Turkish-Russian relations in the modern day. Yeah. Um, Turkish-Russian relations were pretty good up until about 2011, 2012, and that's when things started to go down. Um, before that, there was some complication with a number of uh, Chechen uh, uh, jihadists um, that were – operating out of Turkey, um, and uh, Russian secret services would periodically uh, pop down and assassinate them. Uh, but Turkey uh, did not really take any action to control them. But that was viewed as, as kind of a minor irritant. You know, just but just let me right there for one second. Um, you know, in, in, in an, I guess, years ago, or, or in a saner world, where one with less euphemism, that would actually be, you know, looking at that. Yeah, NATO country is uh, basically training and sending the military operatives into Russia, be treated as if there were, you know, an invasion of Russia by by NATO, and uh, that they were at war, some low grade, but at war. Yeah, um, it, it certainly could be seen that way, and certainly the Turkish government was looking, at the very least, looking at the other way. With regard to these uh, uh, Chechens, uh, you know, using their their territory as a fallback base of operations and safe haven, uh, and and very likely uh, there was some Turkish intelligence support of them. And NATO, I, I, of course, Turkey is of course a NATO member. This sounds like what what the uh, U.S. accused Afghanistan of doing after two thousand one, actually, and the response there was Pakistan. rather aggressive. Pakistan, you mean, right? No, no, they they accused oh, yeah. First, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, and that's that's that was the raison for you know yeah, behind, yeah. yeah for the operation and all the other right. wars, by the true. way. Yeah. Well, and yeah, that's true. That's very true. The whole you know uh, authorization for the use of military force, the AU, all you MFs, <laughs> as yeah. they call it, that that was the raison. Yeah, there are terrorists yeah. lurking there that struck us. Yes, yes. And 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 yet Russia refrained from invading and occupying Turkey for right. some reason, which they could do very it. easily. Yeah. Uh, no, no, they could not. On because the ground, I mean, on the ground. Well, Turkey, yeah, well, even on the ground. Really? Uh, Turkey is a NATO member, and Turkey does have the second largest army. Oh, really? In NATO, I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah, the, Turkey has been building up its military forces, uh, you know, for, for, you know, many reasons, uh, you know, over the last few decades. Greece, you know, it's it's ongoing conflict with fellow Greece, mem uh, Tur NATO member Greece not being the only reason. But but Turkey is a I wouldn't say they're a great power, but they're definitely a major regional power and they've got influence that extends into the Caucasus, Central Asia, all over the Middle East, into Europe. Uh, they, they, they are not someone, you know, to be dissuaded with. They have a half um, of 437,000 active personnel under personnel, arms, apparently, yeah. and then 380,000 yes. in reserve. And, and, sure. and the population is about half of uh, Russia's, right? It's about, about, yes. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. yes. And they've got significant uh, NATO armaments, right? Because right, they've been too. buying NATO. Uh, 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 if not the most advanced, then 
probably second line, uh, you know, NATO armaments, uh, you know, for several decades. Oh, for sure. Uh, and the U.S. would yeah. use the first line anyway. If, if Russia invaded, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't mean to, I was ignoring this just for the sake yeah. of saying that yeah. physically they could occupy it pretty easily. Yes. But, but uh, there would be no such thing because Russia would get blown up, then the U.S. would get blown up, and then there's no more. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, there'd be World War Three. yeah. Um, so in 2011, Erdogan signed on with the Obama uh, administration's uh, plans to overthrow the Syrian government by backing jihadis in right. the country. Um, and they signed on in a big way. And Turkey was absolutely instrumental to this because right. Turkey, at least, you know, uh, for the northern part of, of, of the country, shall we say, uh, Turkey is where everything happened out of, right? right? You needed to get arms, funding, training uh, to these Islamists and jihadists, and there's a very fine, there's a not fine line, I should say a very gray, uh, porous line, you know, between the two persuasions. Not that I think either one of them uh, is a, a better solution. Uh, you know, this is a very sectarian um, feud. Uh, yeah, a feud in Syria. You have all of the, shall we say, the, the uh, ethno-religious minorities of Syria uh, including most secular Sunnis, against Sunni Islamists and Wahhabists. And, right. and the Sunni Islamists and Wahhabists were supported in a big way by Turkey. The U.S. actually had what it called mom centers for years. And that that was literally the acronym they used. And that is where all of the funding from all the states aligned to overthrow uh, the uh, Assad government in Syria, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, UAE, Bahrain, the United States, the UK, Turkey, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know, and, and most other uh, uh, EU countries. Uh, that's that's where they came to collect their paychecks. They drop off their families um, uh, right. uh, to receive their training, receive their you know the distribution of arms happened out of there. Uh, in the south, this was done for a while uh, with Jordan. Um, and and that's how you know the the proxy war to overthrow the Syrian government with jihadis went, uh, right. and of course early on in that conflict, I've, all through the conflict, these Islamists and jihadis were allied with Al Qaeda. Uh, they still are today. In fact, Al Qaeda still controls uh, you know at least half of of Idlib province, right. which is the largest territorial extent that uh, and the largest number of of jihadists under arms that 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 uh, Al Qaeda has ever had. Technically, Al Qaeda is stronger, you know, uh, on an international basis than they ever have been. But early on in the conflict, they were all allied with ISIS as well. ISIS right. was was a partner of the U.S., Turkish, and Saudi-backed uh, Islamists and jihadists, and with Al Qaeda and ISIS. They were all together when when Aleppo was overthrown. And, so and just went, and just by the way, a parallel track, and actually it, it went to its conclusion. Um, uh, in Libya, you had uh, some of the yeah. same elements, and with Qatar offering their yeah, uh, placing their officer corps in charge of them on the ground, and. Yes. A no-fly zone imposed on them, so that Libya's air force couldn't defend the country, and a seven-month daily, eleven-hour-a-day in every city air campaign by NATO in support of the jihadis on the ground that were being run by the Qataris. It was, I mean, this is how they play now. That's I want people to understand that they were not able to get a no-fly zone in Syria, so Syria's air force was able to defend the country, and there is another power in Syria with an air force also, yes, and that's Russia. And now, so the, you get a stalemate in Syria, yeah. and you know, a, a runover in uh, Libya, and they will yes. characterize Libya as a defense of freedom, and Syria as an invasion by Russia. Yeah. Uh, so Russia didn't like this activity going on. Syria has, you know, long been uh, an ally or, or you know, a um, sub-client state relationship. Uh, it, it wasn't quite that much de degree of control. Uh, but Russia uh, and the Soviet Union have several times in the last century been the guarantor of uh, Syrian uh, sovereignty and independence against the West. And yep. in 2015, uh, Russia militarily intervened, uh, sending troops into Syria. Um, and um, this 
prevented plans that were ongoing from the Obama administration and Turkey to input a no fly zone a safe zone as they called it uh which would you know then morph into the larger regime change operation uh in north syria uh yep. and uh this this was really fraught because for turkey for russia to get troops to syria um uh, naval forces have to pass through the dardanelles straits which right. are of course uh governed by turkey Air forces could not fly over Turkey because, uh, you know, Turkey was essentially an enemy in this conflict. Right, right. And uh, at one point, Turkey shot down a Russian a, plane, a Russian warplane on the Syrian Turkish right. border yep. um, with American made jets, right. uh, firing American made missiles. And right. then uh, probably one with of the AWACS, pilots, by the way, probably with American yeah. operating AWACS. Yes. Then the, one of the pilots was killed on the ground by Turkish right. uh, or, or in the parachute falling by Turkish jihadists and Turkish gray wolf nationalists right. who were on hand, uh, you know, uh, providing support for them. And one of the others was eventually uh, the other pilot was eventually rescued out through a combination of operations with um, uh, Iranian uh, special forces. Soleimani was actually involved right. in planning that right. and Hezbollah. Uh, so the, the tensions between Russia and uh, Turkey got really tense after that, um, after the shooting down of the Russian plane. Uh, Russian uh, air assets had to fly around Turkey, around uh, down through Iran and Iraq, which gave uh, Russia uh, uh, airspace access and then into Syria the other way because they had to go around Turkey. Uh, Turkey could not block the flow of naval assets because of the Montreux Treaty, uh, which if they actually did break it uh, would, would probably – uh, quickly lead to a World War III type situation. Right. Uh, it's a very important geopolitical choke point, the crossing of the terms of the treaty of which would be a, a major global incident. Uh, they didn't, although they did attempt several times to kind of slow traffic, Russian traffic uh, through the straits. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, Russia managed uh, you know, the intervention uh, in support of the Syrian government regardless and put heavy sanctions on Turkey because of all of this. Uh, Russian ambassador uh, to Turkey was shot and killed by a Turkish nationalist um, uh, in uh, uh, Ankara. Uh, and uh, that further compl uh, you know, complicated the incident. And Russian bans on Turkish agriculture, uh, tomatoes, uh, produce, and uh, Russian tourism to Turkey uh, were, was seriously hurting the Turkish economy. Right. And then when uh, the U.S. admitted the Obama administration began slowly to back out of the whole intervention thing, and then when Trump came in. Uh, they, uh, the Trump put a stop to the funding of the jihadists uh, by the CIA, the Islamists and the jihadists by the CIA, leaving uh, and, and Saudi Arabia and Qatar uh, also had dropped and Jordan had all dropped out by that time, basically leaving Turkey with the jihadi Islamist bag. Right. And instead, Trump's Pentagon doubled down on what had all the time been the Pentagon's support for the Kurds in East Syria right. as kind of a third force. Uh, and that, that standoff continues in Syria to this day with the U.S. and its proxy Kurds in East Syria sitting on the oil and the wheat, uh, Turkey uh, and its proxy jihadist Islamists and al-Qaeda sitting in North Syria – um, and uh, with the uh, Syrian government, along with its allies, Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah, uh, controlling the majority of the country and certainly the majority of the population. Uh, that continues to this day. But Turkish-Russian relations have also deteriorated in Libya, uh, oh, where yeah. they are on different sides of a proxy conflict there, right. with Turkish uh, security contractors – uh, uh, supporting uh, the east of the country, and where the jihadis um, are—that's where the yeah. jihadis are, basically. No, no, that's that's the west of the country now. Uh, Tripoli. Uh, the the Islamists are now based out of Tripoli, 
um, which is where uh, Erdogan is, uh, and he's actually sent Syrian mercenary his Syrian mercenaries, which have, have become kind of bashi bazook neo Ottoman irregulars for him around the world. <laughs> Um, in his neo-Ottoman stylings. Yes. So there's still in a proxy a conflict that is ongoing there. Then, Turkey became involved in uh, the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, right. which was, has long been seen, the Caucasus has long been seen as Russia's zone of influence. They started backing Azerbaijan, building up Azerbaijan's right. military, providing drone support for them, supposedly sending some Syrian mercenaries as well, and while Russia has kept and keeps good relations with Azerbaijan, also sells them arms, by the way, it has better relations with Armenia, nominally, which is part of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, yeah. the kind of uh, loose NATO analog. Right. Um, and um, that, that Just uh, so if people look at a map while we're describing this, because what you're talking about here, <clears throat> if you, Russia doesn't have there a direct doesn't have a direct border with Turkey in between Turkey is Armenia and to the east of Armenia Azerbaijan uh, and to the north Georgia and then Russia and so Russia borders Azerbaijan and Georgia there and and so what happens is you have if with Turkey siding with Az Azerbaijan it's, they put a squeeze on Armenia which is between the two of them and, and you have Georgia, also Georgia which is leaning to the U.S. To right, the Georgia has, has also been well. A lot of those uh, yeah. they had all kinds. Of, they had a separatist movement there, and and military activity back when, but uh, like in two thousand five, I guess it was two thousand six. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, and so if you see that, essentially NATO is looking to move all the way up uh, to Russia's border there uh, yeah. with alliances, and Armenia. Is kind of in the way in this, and but they're in the middle of Turkey and Georgia and Azerbaijan and uh, the northern part of Iraq where the uh, Kurds are. Yeah, Russia certainly didn't uh, uh, like uh, Turkey intruding, trying to intrude their zone of entrance into this conflict and help spark this conflict. Russia has long liked that as a Frogazan conflict where they balance their relations within Armenia and Azerbaijan. And once again, Armenia, uh, Russia, at, at, after uh, you know, significant gains by the Turkish-backed Azerbaijani forces, uh, a ceasefire was brokered by Russia uh, that nominally included a, a token spot um, without any real substance uh, in that for uh, Turkey. Uh, in the uh, uh, ceasefire agreements, but Russia has has managed to once again at a at a new level balance those relations there. Right. But Turkey has also become a drone power over the years. It used its drones to some to some success in both Libya and Syria when Russian air defense wasn't immediately on hand, um, and. Uh, and then it used them very effectively in Azerbaijan against uh, Armenian-backed uh, forces uh, in the Gorno Karabakh and what were the seven then Armenian-occupied territories. Um, Erdogan has now selling drones to U.S.-backed uh, putsch regime in Ukraine, in Kiev, and to Poland as well. Um, and these are, are seem to be fairly effective combat drones. Yeah. So these are not these are not little you know remote controlled things. So Russia has been looking on this. Uh, uh, you know, they, they are seeing geopolitical conflict right. uh, with Turkey a across a whole length of borders. Yep. And then going into the UNGA a few weeks ago, Erdogan at the UNGA says, uh, you know, quite uh, loudly and provocatively that he uh, does. That Turkey does not recognize the Russian annexation of of Crimea because, right. of course, because of the connection between the Ottoman Empire and the Crimean Khanate centuries right. ago, right. they still maintain a a paternal attitude that they think they have a claim a, a claim in Crimea as well. Um, so that that is the Russian Turkish side going in. Now, Erdogan has long played Russia and the U.S. off each other to his own geopolitical advantage. Right. They both need Turkey. The U.S. needs Turkey in NATO to project military power into the Middle East and to provide that bulwark, you know, kind of containing Russia 
uh, from the South. Which is also uh, what the whole thing yeah. over Crimea is about. In fact, about. including the coup of Ukraine to, to grab yeah. that because that's this yeah. major Russian yeah. naval base in that part of the world. World. And the Black Sea has become a zone of, of geopolitical interest uh, uh, again, too, because of that. Right. And Russia needs Turkey, one, because it's you know, uh, a neighboring state just across the Black Sea. Um, and um, they control the Strait, the Dardanelles Straits, through which Russian naval forces and the Black Sea access the Mediterranean and then on to the Atlantic. But also trade, right? Uh, which is you know, business, a, a major right. choke point there, right? Right. Yeah, right. Um, they have significant uh, business relations, Russia and Turkey. Um, now, while all of this geopolitical conflict is going on, um, Russia and Turkey have managed their relationship in a different way than the U.S. does with countries that it has geopolitical conflicts with. When the U.S. has geopolitical conflicts, it also wages economic warfare against them, right? Sanctions them, right. Uh, you know, seven ways from Sunday and, and, you know, tries to stop off all trade and all of its uh, allies from doing trade and, and so on and is now – I don't know, sanctioning a significant portion of the global population right. at this point. They're sanctioning themselves into yeah. a corner. <laughs> Russia and Turkey have been, have you know, through a series of, of meetings between Putin and Erdogan, have compartmentalized their relationships. They've put economics basically in a separate box from their geopolitical conflict flashpoints. And their economic trade is booming. Russia provides most of Turkey's energy... Uh, through national gas. They've built a Turk stream pipeline now through Turkey, which brings gas, uh, you know, another supply of gas to Turkey. This is just in the last few years. This pipeline was also sanctioned like Nord Stream 2 to the north uh, by the U.S., uh, but it received much less publicity uh, during that. This pipeline now extends into Europe, southern Europe, uh, and it has become a, a southern route for Russia to send uh, gas uh, into Europe going around Ukraine through Turkey, through which, of, of course, Turkey then uh, collects transit fees. Um, and Russia is building a nuclear power plant uh, for Turkey. Um, uh, Russians buy a lot of Turkish produce, tomatoes and so on. And a lot of Russians go on uh, vacation in Turkey. It's very important tourism. Russian tourism is very important for what is a very struggling Turkish economy. Um, and uh, Russian uh, Erdogan uh, at this meeting then thanked Putin for Russian uh, firefighting planes, big giant planes that dump water, for coming to Turkey and help fighting forest fires in Turkey this year. So they've got a very – they separate their their burgeoning economic relations from their geopolitical conflict. And a lot of people don't understand that. I, I think it's – my best way to picture this – is to picture the relationship between Turkey and Russia is Putin and Erdogan waltzing together, hand in right. hand, across a chessboard with daggers poised at each other's back right. and smiles on their faces. Right. That's, that, that, that's the way to picture it. it is, they're both yeah. too important to each other. They also both do not very much are trying to avoid being drawn into a direct war with each other because they see the long history of Turkish Russia wars um, and they, you know, through history of Ottoman Russian uh, Romanov Empire wars, and they know that uh, such a war would be disastrous to both countries. So they go right. out of their way. Meanwhile, Turkey playing Russia and the U.S. off each other has had estranged relations with the U.S. since the, the coup attempt against him a few years 2016. ago. 2016. That was after. Okay, it was November of 2015 they, the Turkey shot down the plane. Yes. And then it was in 2016 that there was an attempted coup, which the U.S. was strongly implicated in, in favor of a yeah. guy who's about 50 miles from where I am right now in the Poconos. And yeah. and, uh, and the, the word that we got was that uh, uh, Erdogan was tipped off about it and protected, saved him uh, by uh, Russia. 
yeah, that didn't happen, and both both Russian and Turkish leaders have it admitted as much. Right. Personally, I don't believe that the U.S. was actively involved in regime change efforts against Erdogan in Turkey because they're usually much better at about it. They're yeah. much smarter. There, there, there were no elements all. of civil society. There was no mass protest. Right. None of the things, the things they that do. you typically see. Right. But, this, but, but the, they did tolerate it. This guy is here yeah. in the Poconos. Yeah. They they did not warn. Well, okay. I don't think it was the Golanists. <laughs> oh, real? Okay. That's another question. I, I don't think okay. the Golanists were involved in it. Russia, um, the, the actual comments from Putin on it were, well, if Turkey – if if – Erdogan says it was the Golanists. We have uh, – I have no reason to say anything different. That's, that's exactly what he said. That's I think pretty that slippery. Yeah, a, yeah, 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 yeah. An abortive Kemalist coup like every coup before it where the Turkish right. military right. – um, as the secular guarantee of the Turkish Republic right. has staged coups against uh, democratically elected Islamist leaders right. in an attempt to maintain the secular nature of the Republic. Right. This was the last such one, and it died with a whimper because Erdogan knew it was going to happen and kind of early released it under controlled circumstances. Mm -hmm. I believe the U.S. did not warn him about it, and a lot of it was done by U.S. trained uh, Turkish Air Force forces, uh, and uh, Erdo and and some of them were were uh, people who were stationed at Insular, at one of the U.S. Uh, right. military bases in Turkey. But I don't think the U.S. was actually involved in supporting them. But I don't think that they warned Turkey about it either. Erdogan knew it was happening. Russia did send a message to Turkey. I think Turkey already the Turk Erdogan already knew it was happening, right. but appreciated right. that. The heads you know, up. The difference in the right. two relationships. There. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that went off and Erdogan's plane was almost shot down. He went up into his version of Air Force One and the Turkish Air Force. I don't believe it was Golanists. <laughs> you know, I don't believe there's that many Golanists in the Turkish military. <laughs> flying F-15s. Uh, and society, right. I believe it. Right. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Turkish Air Force uh, attempted to shoot down uh, and uh, – Erdogan had a problem with this because his air really? defense, uh, he, he has not been granted Patriot missiles by the U.S. And what air defense he has, you know, uh, the identify friend foe function doesn't, you know, uh, allow him to shoot on U.S. Oh, wow. uh, aircraft, right? Uh, U.S. built aircraft. This is why Erdogan wants the S-400 so bad uh, right. from Russia, the right. air defense system that he's willing to risk U.S. sanctions for because of that incident, which was a personal threat to his life. He – it's a, one, it's a hedge against you know Western Air Force you know, if they decide someday to overthrow Erdogan. Uh, but more than that, it's a hedge against his, his own people, military, right, right which is – always lean towards the U.S., particularly the Air Force, that if such an incident happens again, he's able to act against it with Russian uh, air defense, which would have no problem firing on U.S. built uh, warplanes. That's that's why he's willing to go to such extremes there. I got you. I was, we only have like a minute left, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. We, we, all we did was yeah. set it up. We didn't get to get into the whole meeting. But. Yeah. Going into this meeting, uh, Erdogan didn't get what he wanted. He didn't even get a meeting with Biden on the sidelines of the UNGA, and uh, he was very disappointed in that. And he announced out of it saying, I'm going to seek better relations with Russia. He said that publicly. Mm -hmm. And then he went into the meeting with Sochi, uh, with Putin in Sochi. Now, of course, Russia – you know, would like to. Uh, I think Putin would would really like to tell Erdogan to go pound sound up his butt, but uh, he, he's pragmatic and cold blooded and, and realist in relations, and he sees another chance to further drive wedges between Turkey and NATO, which is to you know Russia's uh, you know severe advantage. Not that Turkey's going to drop out of NATO, but the tense relationships there make it hard for, for NATO to operate. So Russia, of course, is exploiting that. They didn't really come to any agreements on any of the geopolitical flashpoints, but they may have toned down a big military buildup on both sides in Idlib, where both sides looked like they were about to start renewed conflict and that, in North Syria there. That's very, very good news, too, because it means, at least at the moment, that that's not going to flare up into something much worse. Yeah. Mark, thank you very much. We'll speak with you next week. Maybe we can go into some of the details of that, depending on what happens between now and then. Thanks for having me, Tom.
And that's all the news we have for you right now. For Community Public Radio, I'm Don DeBar in New York. Thanks for listening. <laughs>